Do you find it a very daunting experience that uh, yesterday you were a nanny looking after children? Um, now you're about to uh, marry the Prince of Wales, and, and one day you would, all, in all likelihood, be queen. It is, but I've had a small run up to it all in the last six months. <laughs> and next to Prince Charles, I know I can't go wrong. She tore out pages from that dusty old book and she rewrote those rules. She changed the royal family forever. Princess Diana's fashion style is iconic and really it can be divided into three major eras. Free Charles during the royal years and post-separation. It was just like a phenomenon. I mean, people would scream when they saw Diana. It was almost like Beatlemania. People are still channeling looks that she wore decades ago. She inspires designer collections from Off-White to Celine. That's a sign of an icon of our times because she was truly inspirational and unique. In the summer of 1980, the Queen told me that a young girl was coming to stay for the weekend. Oh, but Prince Charles did give us a hint himself. He said we wouldn't have to wait too long. <laughs> he said we wouldn't have to wait too long. Uh, was he completely off theme? Was he? Sorry, I, sorry. Was he completely off theme when he said we wouldn't have to wait too long? Uh, okay. <laughs> My name is Paul Burrell. For 21 years, I looked after the British royal family. For 11 years, I looked after Her Majesty the Queen, and for the following 10 years, Princess Diana. So I'm standing in the front hallway of Balmoral Castle on the black and white tiles, waiting for this car to arrive. And out of the car comes a shy young girl that nobody knew who she was. She had one little suitcase in the back. Is that all you've brought with you? You're here for the weekend. You have to go to hunting, shooting, you have to go to the Gillies Ball, tea parties, lunch parties, and that's all you have. She says, will it do? I said, I think we'd better take you to a room and find out. Well, Princess Diana was the daughter of an earl. Her father was Lord Spencer, and he was later Viscount Althrop. They had a house on the Sandringham estate, and then when Diana's grandfather died, they moved to the family stately home, Althrop. And the Spencer family were quite an ancient aristocratic family, and Diana was very proud of her heritage. I mean, they were actually probably grander than the royal family. So in the early years, Diana was very much conservative, very, very shy, and you can tell from when she is posing in pictures in that era, she sort of has her head to the side and she's very stooped, so it's as if she's trying to disappear. Hi, my name's Penny Goldstone. I'm the fashion editor at Marie Claire UK. She didn't really deal well with media attention at the time. She saw photographers following her and she said, look, I'm you know, working at this kindergarten. Do come and follow me and I, you can take a picture of me and then sort of leave me alone and she was wearing a sweater vest over a shirt and a long skirt and ballet pumps and one of the iconic pictures that time and it just made headlines while she was taking the pictures, the sun shone and she didn't realise it was shining through her skirt. So you could see her legs, which in itself is not particularly shocking, but she 
didn't realise she was giving the paps what they wanted and she was said to be horrified by it and that it was a very hard lesson to learn and you can tell then throughout the years that she knew what shots not to give them. She grew up in Althorp Estate, so she had this country style, it was more functional than anything else. And as she moved into Calhoun Court, when she lived with her housemates when she was younger, her style remains quite pared back. It's demure, she wears pie crust collars and cardigans and sweater vests and pleated skirts. I mean, she works at a kindergarten, it's not as much a focus for her. My name's Natasha Harding and I'm fashion editor for Cosmopolitan UK. In her early years, I think the most memorable style that she wore was obviously for her engagement shoot with Prince Charles. And that dress has quite an interesting story behind it. It's a two-piece electric blue suit and it's got this glorious white pussy blow blouse underneath. And what originally happened is she went to Belleville Sassoon to find her look. And the sales assistant didn't recognize her. It was a bit like that pretty woman scene. They were very much like, we, you know, we can't help you. But luckily, David Sassoon then realized the mistake and invited her back. From there, the three of them started to form quite a glorious fashion relationship and they went on to design her honeymoon outfit. But the Belleville Sassoon outfit that she wore for the engagement shoot was quite considered. It matched her sapphire blue engagement ring and it's the start of how we know Diana now and she's starting to use fashion for a reason. Well now you can appear in public yes. it must be a great yeah. relief to you. But it is rather, yes. Yeah. Can, you, can you find the words to sum up how you feel today both of you? Difficult to find the right mm. sort of word isn't it really? Just delighted and, and happy and I'm, I, I'm amazed that she's uh, been brave enough to take me on. <laughs> and I suppose in love. Of course. Whatever in love means. <laughs> well, it you obviously, your means, own interpretation, uh, obviously it? means two very happy people. Yes, yes. Once again, congratulations. Well, from us, congratulations. Thank you, Thank you very much. Be kind. No, Diana wasn't prepared for overnight stardom. Nobody is. No, she was, you know, she was a country girl. She was very naive. She'd never even had a proper boyfriend. So she wasn't remotely prepared for that kind of stardom, and it, and it was frightening. There's nobody, nobody helped her, nobody told her, because this was the first time it had happened. Balmoral is the royal family holiday home. Every summer, the royal family just decamped to the Scottish Highlands, and it's actually said that it's one of the Queen's favorite places to be. They do a lot of hunting there, walks, sort of nature-focused activities. The dress code is quite laid back. However, that is very much during the day. So it is said that the royals actually change outfits several times a day for various occasions. So they'll have an outfit for breakfast. They'll have an outfit for going out and outdoor activities, dinners. So it's not as laid back as you would think. And actually that is kind of part of what they would have called a bit of a test for Princess Diana for her first visit there a couple of months before the royal wedding. Will you stay for a while and have a chat with me? I'm completely out of my depth, she said. So I stayed. What time do you go down for tea? Four o'clock. You go down to the small drawing room. The Queen will pour you a cup of tea. I don't like tea. I'll make sure she has coffee there waiting for you. Then what happens? I said, when tea's cleared, you go into the drawing room and then the Queen will pour you a gin and tonic. I don't drink. I'll make sure there's a glass of water there for you. Then what happens? Then the Queen plays cards on her card table. Do you play bridge? Yes. Then make sure you're sat at the card table to play bridge with the Queen. That's a good way to get to know Her Majesty. Then the Queen will take the dogs into the garden. Maybe you could suggest you went for a walk with her. Also a good time to get Her Majesty's ear. That's what you want to do. This young girl was fascinated by this routine of royal households. And as I closed the door that day, I noticed the name on the door, Lady Diana Spencer. Diana having the upbringing that she had, she passed with flying colors. And one of the looks which stands out most from her trip to Balmoral is one where she's standing next to Charles and they're posing in front of a fence. And Diana is wearing this really kitschy, hot pink jumper. And she looks really relaxed. And she's got a turtleneck underneath. And she's wearing these corduroy trousers and these bottle green hunter boots. And you can just tell by the outfit that she's wearing, the way she's holding herself. She's so relaxed. She's really at ease. 
For her off-duty look at Balmoral, Princess Diana was photographed with the famous hunter boots. We all know them now as a festival essential. Kate Moss wears them, all the celebrities wear them, and they're you know, deemed really cool. But actually, you could argue that Princess Diana is the one who put them back in fashion because she was photographed wearing them at the Scottish estate. One of Diana's most famous pieces was her black sheep jumper. And we first see her wearing it when she goes to the polo, she's engaged to the Prince Charles. And in the picture, she's quite shy, she's not performing for the cameras, and she has this little tiny collar poking out the top of the black sheep jumper, and she's wearing jeans, she's very casual. And interestingly, this rowing blazer's design, she then rewears two years later. And you can very much tell that there has been a shift between the two pictures. In the second image, she's standing straighter, she's kind of looking at the camera, and the jumper obviously has a black sheep on it. So I think the first time she wore it, it was obviously just she found it, it was a cute jumper, wasn't thinking anything about it. The second time, the jumper is slightly different, so we don't actually know what happened between the two, if she lost weight or just lost it. And the sheep is actually facing a different direction to the white sheep. And she was also wearing a white shirt underneath with a black bow that sort of points to the, the black sheep. And a lot of people were saying that it was a statement at the time because there were already a few arguments with Prince Charles. She was considered a bit of a rebel. She didn't want to follow all the rules in the family. So it sort of symbolized her being the black sheep of the royal family. Well, the cracks in their relationship, I think they began to show very quickly because Diana didn't understand. I mean, after she, she became engaged to Prince Charles, he, he never seemed to be around. He was always so busy. And she was moved into Buckingham Palace, and she had her own apartment there, and he, he was sort of down the corridor. And she was absolutely on her own. I mean, a friend of mine, actually, was her footman and told me a lot about her at the time. And she was very lonely. She didn't feel she could have her girlfriends there. And I mean, Buckingham Palace is, is a quite a strange place for a teenage girl to be incarcerated, which is really what she was. I personally think that Diana fell in love with Prince Charles. It's obvious to me that she was a young, naive girl, and she fell in love with the prince. Now, if you watch that, that piece of footage when Prince Charles is asked, are you in love, sir? Princess Diana's beaming, and she's giggling, saying, yes, yes, yes. And he says, whatever love is. And she looks at him as if to say, what are you talking about? Don't you know what love is? That was the problem from the beginning. Charles didn't really know what love was. I, Diana Francis. I, Diana Francis. Take thee, Charles Philip Arthur George. Take thee, Philip Charles Arthur George. To my wedded husband. To my wedded husband. To have and to hold. To have and to hold. From this day forward. From this day forward. According to God's holy law. According to God's holy law. And thereto I give thee my troth. And thereto I give thee my troth. Diana's wedding dress really is one for the ages. It is peak 80s extravagance and opulence, and it was a statement. It is arguably the most iconic wedding dress throughout history, or at least one of. The reason being, when she stepped out at St. Paul's Cathedral, all eyes were on her. She had these glorious, huge puff sleeves. She had ruffles down the front, a full skirt, sequins, 10,000 pearls, and a train that ran for 25 feet. 
It was designed by, at the time, husband and wife duo David and Elizabeth Emmanuel. And really interestingly, they didn't have a brief for it. So obviously for the designers, it was quite a momentous task to undertake and the pressure for the designs not to be revealed was really quite high. David and Elizabeth Emmanuel set up their fashion business in London's Brook Street in 1977. They were a young team specialising in expensive, high fashion romantic clothes, particularly evening wear and dreamy wedding dresses, but they've never made a royal wedding dress before. All their designs are individual. If you have a dress made here, you won't see anyone else wearing the same thing. Princess Anne shops here, so does Princess Michael of Kent, the Duchess of Kent and Bianca Jagger. Although the couple have made clothes for Lady Diana before, they never really thought they'd get this job, and tonight they said it was too early to say how it might look. But how did they feel when they first heard? Very honoured and very happy and delighted, obviously, with the news. And what about you, Elizabeth? Over the moon, very thrilled. How long will it take to make? Early days, from now till, till the end, to the day of the wedding, we'll be working on it. Any ideas at the moment? Not yet, because it's early days and a lot of discussion has to take place and, you know. And what are you going to do tonight to celebrate? Um, just go home and see the children, I think. <laughs> do they know yet? Uh, but they're too young to know, but uh, we'll tell them when they get older. It was such a huge deal. It was the biggest royal wedding in decades, if not more, because the Queen had quite a, you know, a paired back wedding and it wasn't a televised affair, whereas this, everyone was going to watch. So what they did is they actually did a second wedding dress, which never really saw the light of day. It was very similar to it, but more paired back. They say it had a deeper V-neck neckline and just fewer ruffles, fewer pearls, more understated. Their wedding marked this new sort of era in the royal family, so it had to be a big moment. And because it was going to be such a big moment, the identity of the dress and what it looked like had to be kept really under wraps. Although you don't really see Princess Diana's shoes in any of the pictures or the videos, they were designed by the Emmanuels as well, and they were designed to match the dress, and they featured a lace, a few pearls, had a heart on the toe, and really there was a lovely little romantic detail to them, because Princess Diana was rather romantic, so she had C and D designed under the sole of the shoe. So you didn't see it, but obviously she knew it was there and it was a sweet nod to her husband-to-be. Really interestingly, it said that after her divorce, Princess Diana didn't want to wear any Chanel logo items because it was the, the interlocked two Cs, so it thought she thought it was too much of a reminder of Prince Charles and Camilla. I remember the wedding of Prince Charles and Lady Diana Spence very well because I was at Buckingham Palace. At the end of a very long red carpeted corridor, I noticed this ball of white racing towards me. And I realized it was Princess Diana. She'd rolled her train up into a ball, tucked it under her arm. She had her slippers in one hand and she was racing down this corridor. She says, but you know, the most wonderful thing was walking down the Isle of St. Paul's Cathedral with my father. She's but did you ever look at the footage of that? She's next time you look at it, watch me. She's can't you see me looking from side to side? Can you see me doing that? Do you know what I'm doing? I'm looking for her. I'm looking for Camilla. And she was there. She was even at my wedding. So this spectre of Camilla was always there in the princess's life. I think Diana uh, had terrible jitters on her wedding day. In fact, the night before, she, she'd wanted to get out of the whole thing. And she'd had a sort of funny, jokey evening with her sisters. And they said, you can't get out of it now. Your face is on the tea towels. And that made her laugh. But she discovered about Camilla. She discovered that Charles was giving her gifts. And she didn't know the half of it, but she knew that Camilla was a very important person in her fiance's life. And she, be she says she became obsessed, absolutely obsessed, so that when she was walking down the aisle, she spotted Camilla in the, in the congregation. 
But she said what sort of helped her at that moment was concentrating on her father, because he just had a stroke, and she was really, and he's a very big man, and she was really guiding her father, and she concentrated on that. So of course she got the names wrong. She was all of a dither. Princess Diana fell pregnant quite quickly after the royal wedding with Prince William, and that was going to mean the heir to the throne, the first royal baby in a long time. Naturally, everyone was interested and in, already in love with her, so wanted to photograph her maternity style at every step of the way. Perhaps the most notable thing about Diana's maternity style is that she didn't try to blend in. A lot of pregnant women even today probably don't feel comfortable or don't want to showcase their growing bump. And historically, in the royal family, you, you didn't really show your bump either. You know, as recently as the Victorian era, you had Victorian pregnancy corsets. And she would wear bright colours, she would wear prints, so often she embraced the polka dot print in her looks, and she would wear statement outfits that didn't try and shy away from the spotlight. And one of the most significant looks for her maternity wardrobe was this Catherine Walker gown that she wore in 1984. She wore it on the red carpet, and the gown itself was incredibly beautiful and elegant, and it was powder blue and it had a sort of blazer top and a dropped waist and a full skirt. But the dropped waist served a function of sort of exaggerating her bump and it really embraced her shape and it was a celebration of all things to do with maternity chic. The princess had left her packing to the last minute, undecided as to which clothes to take with her, and no doubt adding some wet weather gear for Alice Springs. Still, the departure went smoothly. Among the farewell party, Australia's High Commissioner, Sir Victor Garland and Lady Garland. The British press have dubbed it the Royal Tour into the Unexpected, making much of the potential weather problems and the Republican leanings of Prime Minister Bob Hawke. And as the Prince has long been a familiar figure in Australia, there's no doubt in London that it will be the Princess and her baby who capture the limelight in the weeks ahead. It will be May by the time they return to London after their Australian and New Zealand tour, They'll then prepare for a similar tour of Canada in mid-June. The Royal Tour of Australia and New Zealand was a big deal for Diana. It was the first international tour that she was going to do, and it wasn't that long after she gave birth to Prince William, and she actually asked for him to come on tour even though it wasn't the done thing. Because the Prime Minister of Australia wrote to them and said, would you like to bring your little baby with, it, with you? They also extended the tour and they included New Zealand as well. So it was a six week tour, which is a, is a long, long time. And it was, uh, you know, as Diana described it, as a baptism of fire. And then there was a question and answer session revealing some minor royal secrets. Question, what is Prince William's favorite toy? Um, Jamie, he loves his koala bear he's got but he hasn't got anything particular. He just likes something with a bit of noise. Um, he got a plastic whale that throws things at the top, little balls. <laughs> Thank you. Question, how many rooms are there in Buckingham Palace? I haven't actually counted them. Uh, and even if I did, I dare say there'd be quite a lot that uh, people didn't know about, um, that somebody had been living in for many years unbeknownst to anybody else. Question, are you going to get a horse for Prince William? I expect we will. In England, we have something called the, a Shetland pony, which is just a little bit smaller than a, your idea of a pony. So we probably will one day, hopefully, just to encourage him. Throughout that tour, you can start to see the initial signs that Diana is embracing her fashion. So she's wearing brighter colors. She's wearing turquoise, hot pink, and yellow. But notably, the silhouette's still quite feminine, so she'll wear ruffles and she'll have a cinched waist and quite a flowy skirt. So it, they're still quite safe looks considering what she went on to wear. But there's one outfit that she wore in Perth and it's a hot pink dress with polka dots and she has a hat to match. And I think what people loved is that obviously she would stand out in a crowd. And what is more gloriously 80s than a princess wearing hot pink? In the early days, Diana's light was small, but it began to shine brighter and brighter and brighter. And it was a sort of a star is born situation. Prince Charles would say to her, while I married you, I made you a princess. You weren't born royal. I'm the royal. So it would peeve him 
when on royal visits, people would be shouting on one side of the street, we want Diana, we want Diana. I've come to the conclusion that really it would have been far easier to have had two wives. <laughs> to have covered both sides of the street. <laughs> and I could have walked down the middle directing the operation. This is a man who's been born to be king. This is a man who has been treated from the very beginning as a god, suddenly being eclipsed by this woman. He wasn't very happy. To be engaged to such a lovely lady, and my goodness, I was lucky enough to marry her. And uh, we had many, many messages. <laughs> it's amazing what ladies do when your back's turned. <laughs> The Royal Tour of Australia sort of cemented this idea and the start of what we now know as Diana Mania. What she wore became a focus and people wanted to see her outfit. She was carving out this place for herself as an icon which we now know and love and her looks at the time started to show the early signs of what she'd go on to achieve sartorially. Her wardrobe there was really, she was pushing the boundaries. It was really sleek yet bold. There was a beautiful sheer blue metallic dress she wore a ball. There was the dress she was photographed in dancing with Prince Charles. There was a bright pink gown which she wore with her Spencer tiara and people loved it. The pictures just went everywhere. In these six weeks, the Princess of Wales has probably become the world's most photographed woman. It must have been an ordeal, but she's rarely shown it. She's responded to adulation with modesty and spirit. The monarchy will be the benefactor. And there were, of course, the clothes, fashion with a completely individual flair. 50 outfits in 42 days. Originally, she was very much the Sloan Ranger, very middle-class conservative fashion, blazers, high necks, trousers, long skirts, very shy and not really knowing what her style was. And although her wedding dress was really the first moment where she broke boundaries, actually there was a dress that she wore just before, which was also designed by the Emmanuels. And she wore that to a charity gala with Prince Charles, and it was a black sweetheart strapless neckline dress, showed a bit of cleavage, and even Lorne Snowden actually mentioned she looked stunning in it and really everyone looked at her. And it was so spectacular that the next day was meant to be a reveal of the budget, but her dress instead made all the headlines, so they released the budget a day later because this dress was so phenomenal. The 80s was a significant period of transformation for Diana. In this decade, she becomes a wife, a mother, a princess, and also an international icon. At the start, we start to see her in a preppy sort of aesthetic. She's got high cross collars, she's wearing cardigans, sweater vests, pleated skirts, and she'd carry a little woven basket with her when she was spotted around London. On the Royal Tour by 1983, she's starting to experiment a little bit and play with her style, her colors that she's wearing, and different shapes that she'll start to experiment with. By the end of the decade, she's really hit her stride, and she is wearing almost all of the 80s trends, and she's playing quite a significant role in setting them as well. She'll wear tailored angular pieces, she'll wear block colors, dropped waist, padded shoulders. As the 80s went on, she became increasingly confident. So towards the late 80s, for example, she wore lots of sequined gowns, which would perhaps have been thought to be more for Hollywood actresses, but she would wear them and wear them really well. And she actually earned the nickname Dynasty Die 
thanks to them. One of the most famous dresses of that era was the John Travolta dress, which was designed by Victor Edelstein, and it was off-the-shoulder, long-skirted, midnight blue dress, which she wore to dance with John Travolta at the White House. I did notice that one day, going through the drawing room, the old Queen Mother, she passed the magazine table and Diana's face was on the front of Hello Magazine. And as she walked past the table, she flipped the magazine over onto its backside and carried on walking. That to me said, she's not really accepted. They don't like it. She's beginning to outshine even the senior members of the royal family. This is dangerous territory. Then my favourite look of Diana's in the 80s, although I'm tempted to say the John Travolta dress, it was actually a more understated style by one of her favourite designers, Catherine Walker, and she wore it for a dinner in Melbourne in 1988. And it was a light pink kind of ruched dress. It was strapless, sort of a column dress, very chic, with pale blue flowers imprinted on it. And at the back, it featured quite a big, spectacular bow that really elevated the dress. Princess Diana and Catherine Walker's relationship really blossomed in the late 80s, which is when Princess Diana really found her true sort of permanent style and the one that a lot of people know and love. Her designs were well known for being sleek, very tailored and a very sort of minimal aesthetic. And actually Princess Diana was buried in, in one of Catherine Walker's black coat looks in 1997. My favourite Diana look from the 80s has to be when she goes to the polo and the specific outfit she's wearing has got this two-piece set. It's a puffy blouse with a big print on the front of it. It's monochrome and she wears a black leather belt with white trousers and her hair is kind of blown out in this Farrah Fawcett type vibe. And I think this signals the start of another era for Diana. She's starting to find her confidence and starting to use fashion as a way to express herself. And the fact that she also looks quite comfortable and confident, I think, is reflected in the outfit and back into how she must have been feeling back then. So after Princess Diana and Prince Charles separated in the early 90s, the princess's confidence grew and that directly translated into her fashion choices. So she kind of threw the rule book out the window and that resulted in a more minimal aesthetic, but she didn't deprive herself of wearing anything, you know, that would have been deemed more sexy or too sexy before. Sleek fitted designs, muted tones, a bit of a pastel color palette, beiges, blacks, whites, and very sleek and tailored designs, more fitted. So in the 80s, Diana's style is quite experimental and she's playing around with the latest trends and she's starting to really hit her stride in terms of her fashion and her aesthetic. By the 90s, her style matures once again and she's starting to dress more for her. And it's believed that this is perhaps her freest decade in terms of what she wears and why she wears what she wears. So instead of donning bright, glittery sequin dresses, she'll lean in more towards a less overt look. She'll go more minimalist. She'll wear simple shift dresses or she'll wear tailored suits. As her style became simpler, it was actually more accessible. So whereas before she was the unattainable princess, now she was more of a chic civilian, as it were. Her looks were copied and they influenced a lot of celebrities from Madonna to Cindy Crawford to Elizabeth Taylor. Princess Diana revealed her very famous 90s sleek haircut on the Vogue cover in 1990. And that was arguably her most iconic look and spurned so many copies. You know, she was the original, the Rachel. A lot of people went to hairdressers asking to copy that look. And it was beautiful and sleek and really went with her wardrobe of the 90s. When she was a princess, she wore a lot of UK brands and very traditional ones. But when she left the royal family and became even more of an international icon because she embraced lots of other big brands such as Versace and Dior. And of course, we all know that they named a Dior bag after her, so the Lady D bag. There was a memo that came from Buckingham Palace. Diana, when you're in public, please wear a hat and please wear gloves. 
because you're touching the public and you might catch something. Historically speaking, the royal family, when they met with crowds, they often wore gloves as a way of not catching germs and not becoming ill. But Princess Diana made headlines because she chose not only not to wear gloves to meet patients with AIDS, but she also hugged them and held their hands. And at the time, there was still the belief that if, if that, that is how you could catch AIDS, if you touched AIDS patients. HIV does not make people dangerous to know. So you can shake their hands and give them a hug. Heaven knows they need it. What's more, you can share their homes, their workplaces, their playgrounds, and their toys. We all need to be alert to the special needs of those for whom AIDS is the last straw in an already heavy burden of discrimination and misfortune. We lived in a world of ignorance. We lived in a world where people were not educated. They didn't know. The princess introduced me to the first person dying with HIV and AIDS. She would sit and hold people's hands, and counsel them. Diana really put an emphasis on coming into contact with the public and relating to them and creating a bond. And removing the gloves is symbolic of that. And there's a picture of her in 1991 where she's shaking hands with an AIDS patient, which was significant insofar as it helped dispel a lot of the misconceptions around AIDS at the time. And it was something that was a marked departure from what we'd seen previously in the royal family. We visited a lot of sick children in hospital. And for those visits, because it was already a glum environment, she chose to wear really bright floral neon dresses with jangling jewels so that they would sort of see her as, as a bit of a clown and they could play with her. And it was, you know, all about touching the textures of the dress. And she made them feel like they were really at home with her. Single acts of humanitarianism were what she brought to so many people's lives. She shone a light on their plight. She took the world's media and showed us that we should do more for these people. This is, um, oh, that's my sister-in-law. Did you try to be faithful and honourable to your wife when you took on the vow of marriage? Yes, absolutely. And you were? Yes. Until it became irretrievably broken down. Us both having tried. Prince Charles did an official biography with Jonathan Dimbleby and also a, a TV programme. It was really all about being Prince of Wales. It was the anniversary of, of being Prince of Wales. But of course, Dimbleby, being a very you know, smart operator, asked him the question, which was about Camilla and about his marriage. And, and I, I think that, very honestly, Charles answered it. He probably regrets it, but he was honest. And the princess of that evening was due to go out to the Serpentine Gallery to see her old friend, Lord Palumbo, and open his new exhibition. I can't go. I'm not going. I'm not going. It'll be too humiliating. The whole world now knows that Charles has been having an affair. He's admitted it. You are going, I said. I've got nothing to wear. Yes, you have got something to wear. I went up to her wardrobe room and picked out a Christina Strambolian dress with a fishtail. This is what you're gonna wear, I said. I can't fit into it. Yes, you can, put it on. So she slipped it on. Now, to complement that, I think we should have the pearl choker and the sapphire. That's all you need. High heels and those jewels. Right, she put them on and she looked a million dollars. Remember, when you go out there, I said, you stride, you hold your head high. You smile, you engage, firm handshake. Say to yourself, I am Diana, Princess of Wales, and I am here to stay. Say it to yourself.
three years earlier she'd had the dress made and it was perhaps thought to be a bit daring, it was quite fitted, it was off the shoulder. We can't prove that Diana knew she would eclipse Prince Charles in the headlines the next day, but we do know that she told her stylist that she wanted to look like a million dollars, and that obviously resulted in her pictures being splashed across all the papers the next day and Charles being vilified. It really is a testament to the power of a particular outfit and the impact it can have. I was told a long time ago, I'd back the loser. I'd gone with the one who'd be forgotten. And here we are, we're still talking about her. We're talking about her because she changed the rule book. She changed the rules for the women she'd never meet. Some of Princess Diana's most beloved looks were actually some of her final looks in the 90s because she always looked chic but understated and she actually wore some of her most casual looks in those days, especially when she went to sports days at Prince William and Prince Harry's schools because she didn't want to draw attention to her and away from the boys, so she just wore outfits that any normal mum would wear. But even when she was off duty, Princess Diana's style never faltered. She always, always looked chic. So in the 80s, her outfits are very much the focal point of a lot of her sort of public appearances. And she uses it as a tool to effectively communicate and express herself with the public. And in her final years, you can see that her style starts to become more pared back. And one might argue that that could be because she doesn't want the focus to be as much on what she's wearing, although she looks incredibly chic in her outfits, but more what she's doing, her philanthropic ventures, and she wants that to be forefront. Princess Diana had a bit of an athleisure phase in the 90s. The fact that she would wear slouchy jumpers and cycling shorts and trainers and double denim when she was either doing the school run or if she was going to the gym. These looks have become kind of cemented in cultural history, so much so that years later, decades later, people are still channeling them and paying homage to them. So Hayley Bieber's Vogue shoot took some of her most iconic athleisure wear looks and reimagined them today because the thing about Diana's style is that it remains timeless and it remains cool and relevant. And actually that coincided with cycling shorts coming back in fashion across the catwalk from various designer collections. Princess Diana often wore these cycling shorts, chunky trainers, which again are massively in fashion again, and a virgin Atlantic oversized baggy sweatshirt. Princess Diana actually wore the sweatshirt to taunt photographers a little bit because they were constantly hounding her, bearing in mind this was after the separation. So she thought if she re-wore the same Virgin Atlantic sweatshirt, they would grow bored of her and not photograph her as much. We all remember the two iconic swimsuits she wore when she was on holiday with Jodie L. Fired. So one of them was a leopard print swimsuit while she went jet skiing with him. The other one was a blue swimsuit with a plunging back that she wore to sit at the end of a diving board. And that is a picture that we all remember. Hasnut Khan had been the princess's companion for over two years. Nobody knew about Hasnut Khan that was not played out on the world stage. Whereas, after they'd broken up, the princess was invited to the south of France by the Mahaud al Fayeds. Did you know that the romance of the princess and Dodi al Fayed was 30 days from beginning to end? It only lasted 30 days. That was not the love of her life. That was not the man she was going to marry. That's all fabrication. I spoke to her regularly when she was away. Have you seen Hasnet? I said, yes, I went for a drink with him last night. What does he think of my, me being here in the south of France with Dodé Alfaed? Well, he's not too pleased. Has he seen the pictures in the papers? Yes, he has, because you know his routine. You know every morning he goes to the corner shop and sees the press. You know that. And I know that's what you're doing. You're manipulating the world's media by having these pictures taken to show Hasnet who you're with. It's a sort of a 
Are you jealous? Do you mind? Do you care? Are you bothered? That's what Diana was saying to Hasnat Khan through those pictures in the world's media. And of course, Hasnat was bothered. And I didn't find out until recently that he called her the day before she died on her mobile phone. He called her to try and patch up their relationship. Had she returned to London? I truly believe the romance between Hasnat Khan and the princess would have been rekindled. It was too strong. It was too deep. They were true soulmates. Princess Diana's style, especially in her later years, is still very much referenced today and very much influences designers and trends, from cycling shorts to high-waisted jeans, oversized blazers, square neck dresses. A lot of people want to be like Princess Diana. During her life, Diana wearing some of the biggest trends and influencing the fashion industry is undeniable. I think her legacy today is people are still channeling looks that she wore decades ago. She inspires designer collections from Off-White to Celine to Vogue main cover fashion shoots. She's still incredibly relevant and I think that needs to be remembered. Whenever Kate Middleton or Meghan Markle step out and they wear a look which resembles something Diana has worn, the internet goes wild for it because they love to see these comparisons to who, a person who is arguably one of Britain's most famous fashion icons. She remains relevant and she remains part of the nation's identity. It's hard to choose a favourite look of Diana's, but if I had to, I would say one of her final outfits, which was a blue cocktail dress by Jacques Azaguri, which she wore to a performance of Swan Lake at the Royal Albert Hall. And it was very, very simple, very Audrey Hepburn-esque, and it had thick straps, a square neckline, which has come back in fashion again, another perfect example of how she's influenced designers today. And it was bright blue and it was embellished with sequins and it stopped just above the knee and it was impossibly chic. While Diana's revenge dress is undeniably a favorite for many Diana fans, my favorite look is one that she wore in the 1988 polo match. She's wearing this oversized masculine blazer over this British Lung Foundation charity jumper. She's wearing Levi's with cowboy boots and a cap. And part of this look and why it's become so famous and so ingrained in the Diana history is because it typifies her approach to fashion. She's quite casual, she's laid back, and she is effortlessly cool. And I think that's what this look really sort of represents, and that is why it's one of my favorites. And we're still talking about her. That's a sign of a great woman. That's a sign of an icon of our times. But I'm also talking to a generation of people who were never around. There's a whole new generation of people who didn't know Diana. And I think it, I have a moral obligation to say to those young people, I knew her, I stood beside her. I could feel the warmth which she radiated because she was truly inspirational and unique. Her journey throughout the 80s and into the 90s is one that the nation watched as she grew and as she flourished. And you could see that very much so in what she decided to wear. Her legacy now, the fact that the outfits that she wore years and years ago are still being celebrated, recreated, means that we all agree that Diana was incredibly timeless and stylish and iconic. I remember Princess Diana's style is bold, chic, colourful, paired back, a lot of contradictions and world breaking. I watched Diana blossom from a shy young girl, 18 years old at Balmoral Castle. I watched the years pass by. She was pushed in the deep end and told to swim. She was told to survive. She was never taught to survive. She learned very quickly. And through the romantic years, and then through the power dressing years, and then the simple dressing years, 
becoming a global businesswoman, becoming an icon. I watched all of that, becoming the most famous woman in the world. I saw her as beautiful inside as she was on the outside. What an incredible human being.